our final episode of the Apologetic series here on the SSPX podcast, we'll answer the last remaining question. How do we know with certainty that the Catholic Church is worth joining? We've seen in the last 41 episodes that God exists, that his word is true, that we can find him, that Jesus is him, and that a church was given to us. Now, what does that mean for us? Should we still join a church that through history has had corrupted leaders? Should we join a church that is at times seemingly self-contradictory? Father David Sherry will join us for the final word. Thank you for being here for this episode for a few of them, or maybe some of you have been here for all 42. Regardless, we're privileged that you spent your time with us. We have more series on the way, so be on the lookout on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you're hearing this right now. Our next series is starting this month in February, 2024. And of course, for more information, please visit sspxpodcast.com. Now, let's join Father David Sherry for The Last Word. Father Sherry, it is wonderful to have you back uh, again. We had you a few episodes ago, and now you are the uh, the final word on the apologetic series. So it is it is good to have you today. How are you? Very well, thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you very much for having me back. And uh, it's a great honor to be doing the last episode of this series. Absolutely. Well, I, we are we were talking just a little bit before, and and the question is, how do you wrap up a, a series of, of 40, 41 episodes on explaining all the, the, the logic, the reason, the, the details about the truths of the Catholic faith? How do you tie that up with a bow? And I guess the answer is next steps. So if you are uh, convinced, if you've been watching this and, and are not yet Catholic, have not been baptized, or are interested in... in converting to the faith. I guess, what are the next steps then? I guess that's the uh, the the point of, of this episode. And also for people who are currently Catholics to reinforce this idea that, well, maybe we did make the right choice. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. So the purpose of the series on apologetics, the purpose of apologetics in general, is to show the reasonableness of the belief in God, the reasonableness of of the belief in Jesus Christ being the Savior of the world and the reasonableness of the Catholic Church being, in fact, the uh, true Church which Christ founded. But none of those things are going to force you to make an act of faith because clearly an act of faith means that you say, I believe something that I do not see. So uh, an act of human faith would be when I I say to, to my friend, who's just returned from Antarctica, he told me that there are penguins in Antarctica. I've never seen them myself, but I believe him because uh, he's a trustworthy guy. And uh, the thing is, of course, I could be wrong to believe him because uh, he could have made a mistake uh, or, you know, he could be actually lying to me. And so the belief in God is when we say to God, I believe what you have revealed, God. But of course, I'm not forced to that belief because what forces me to believe is to see. So when I see and touch in with my own hands, then I am forced to, to, to say that this is true. However, even if the person who is talking to me is not capable of deceit, not capable of being fooled, which is the case of God, even then I don't have to make that leap of faith, as it were. And that is why our Lord Jesus Christ, when Thomas said, I will believe when I put my hand into his side, when I put my fingers into the holes in his hands, then I'll believe. And then our Lord Jesus Christ, for our sake, allowed him to do that, and then he says, Thomas, blessed are they who have not seen and yet believe. So this is the the, the virtue. Clearly, in a, in a human sense, we need to believe others. We could never live our lives in society unless there was faith uh, towards human beings. Uh, you told me, for example, that you'd be paying me uh, $5,000 for this final episode, and I believed you. I said, okay, Andrew, uh, I think your check is good. However, if I say, no, no, I don't trust anybody, then, of course, all sorts of human interactions will become impossible. But to believe God 
is to say to God, God, whatever you say, I know that you are the truth. I believe you. But this is a grace which comes from God. So after the apologetics, people, I'm sure, have been listening to the to the series on apologetics, and some people are going to say, well, it's all very interesting, and, you know, mm. there's a lot there that I never knew existed in the Catholic faith, but in the end, you know, I'm not going to convert. Okay, why? Because you're not forced to. It's, it's free. It's, right. a, it's a call from God. So what I would like to, to encourage you to do today is to throw caution to the wind, so to speak. Don't worry about what's going to happen with your friends or with your money or anything else and say, God, I want to believe. I want to convert. Or to say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief, like the man in the gospel. There was a story told, Andrew, one time of a Church of England bishop. And uh, the thing about the Church of England, of course, is that once you poke around a little bit and you study its origins, you see that it originated simply in the desire of Henry VIII to have himself a new wife. So many people, of course, perhaps simple people, don't look into that. And so they can be perhaps in a certain ignorance of that fact. But of course, the the intelligent people, let's say, such as the bishops, they do that. So the bishop looked into it and he discovered, yes, you know, the Catholic Church is definitely the true church. But if I convert, I'm going to lose my position. I'm going to join all the uh, grubby immigrants in the uh, Catholic churches in London. Uh, I may not even become a priest within the Catholic Church, etc. So he did not convert. So one of his friends, uh, in order to show him this, took a piece of paper and wrote the word God on the piece of paper. And he showed it to the bishop and said, what do you see? And the bishop said, well, I see God. And then the friend took out of his pocket a gold coin, covered the word God with the coin, and said, well, what do you see now? Oh, God was covered with money. So those considerations have to be put out of our mind because what really matters to you and to me and to every human being is that we must save our soul. All things that can change will end. But my soul, that will exist forever. And so I must seek what is eternal. And so my call to you, uh, dear friend, who's thinking about converting is, yes, do convert, even in this time of great confusion. Let me explain those two things, uh, if I might. First of all, what do... What do you, I mean by converting? Because people can say, well, I, I convert to the religion of Islam or I might convert to Buddhism or something. To convert literally means to turn back to something. To, uh, to, to convert means to turn to God. Uh, why should I turn to God? Well, because I was made for God. Um, we saw within our series, we know that God exists. There is no other possible explanation for the existence of the universe, for the order of the universe, for the beauty of the universe. We know that God exists. Now, God, the creator then, created the universe. Why did he create the universe? Why did God create the universe? Um, it's quite simple, I think. God created the universe for himself. And there, there's no other possibility. Imagine if you can, God living in eternity. And eternity is not a dimension of time, but it's a dimension outside of time. Uh, so it's all of life lived together at the same time. It's the dimension in which the perfect being lives, who does not change. And he decides that he's going to, create the universe. So why did he create the universe? Well, he was on his own in eternity, so there is no other possible reason that he could have created the universe than for himself. Uh, if I was at home later on today, and I'm on my own, and I say, I'm going to make some food, going to make some dinner, uh, why did I make the dinner? Well, if there were somebody with me, I could say, well, I made the dinner for him, but I was on my own, so I must have made it for myself. And that is mm -hmm. exactly why God did create the universe for himself. 
And every creature within the universe is created for God. And every creature shows the glory of God because as I look at the universe around me, I see the, uh, you know, the amazing uh, beauty of nature, the variety of nature, the, uh, the way that the solar system works, etc. This is all created from God's hand. And all creatures with the universe are for God. But I am not like the other material creatures. I have a soul. And I know that I have a soul because although I'm like the animals in so many ways, I am completely different from them. I am able to think. I am able to judge. I am able to understand concepts. And I'm able to invent. Uh, I can look at the animals and I can see that the animals are not particularly worried about the increasing need for electric vehicles. In fact, none of the animals seem to have yet discovered the wheel. Uh, the animals do not have air conditioning in their nests, etc., etc. Why? Because they just follow their instincts. But I, as a human being, I have a soul. And so I was created for God, but I can't see God just like an animal or just like a plant just simply by following my instincts. In fact, I'm the one animal who can't just follow my instincts. I must judge my instincts. I must seek God with my soul. And this is an infinite need which I have within me for the infinite. I can try to fill it with creatures, that is limited things, and say, well, you know, I'm particularly fond of a particular game. Uh, I, I like tennis. Um, I'm particularly fond of ice cream or whatever it might be, but I'm never going to be able to satisfy myself with these things. And so I have to seek God. St. Augustine uh, summed it up by saying that our hearts were made for thee, O Lord, and they are restless until they rest in thee. Uh, there's a very famous poem by Francis Thompson called The Hand of Heaven, which I encourage anybody who wants to elaborate on that point to read. Uh, it's a man who's trying to flee from God because he's afraid of what God is going to ask him to do and rather tries to find happiness in creatures, but he's never able to because the creatures always uh, turn around and end up being fickle. None of them can satisfy his infinite need for God. Which uh, brings us to the question then, well, how do you find God? And that's, right. the, uh, that's the question which is... Which is uh, the one which all the world is is trying to to answer. All the world is trying to seek uh, the ultimate goal. What is going to satisfy us? And the uh, the the correct uh, understanding of man, which all reasonable people have come to, is that man has somehow fallen. Uh, man is not just good. There's something uh, strange about us. I said a moment ago that we are the uh, only animal who cannot trust his instincts. Animals just trust their instincts. And, uh, you know, if the crocodile eats um, a lamb, that, that's, that's fine. You're not going to lock up the crocodile for murdering a lamb. Uh, he's just following his instincts. But we, if we just follow our instincts, we become demonic. We, uh, we, we go from simply, perhaps innocently following an instinct to eventually uh, setting up this um, disorder as some sort of good. You think, for example, of the current um, the current rules regarding abortion or euthanasia. It's we think, okay, well, you know, in some ways it could be useful to be able to have an abortion. And then it ends up being abortion is a good thing. It's a good thing to kill children or it's a good thing to kill people who are at the end of their lives anyway. So the pagans saw this. I mean, Plato famously uh, hypothesized that a man was a spirit who had been attached to a body as a punishment for some sin. And the, the truth is that original sin, our first parents, Adam and Eve, committed sin. They fail. What do we mean by that? We mean that they turned away from God. A sin is not just a doing something which happens to be materially evil, but it's only 
a sin if you do it with knowledge and with consent. So God gave our first parents a command, said that thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And our parents disobeyed that command. And God had warned them, the day that you do that, the day that you sin, you will die. Now, let me just explain a couple of things here very quickly. One is that the fact that they were told not to eat the fruit doesn't mean that the fruit was bad. So, for example, if you are visiting my home, Andrew, and I say to you, Andrew, uh, I love having you here, but I'd like you not to touch the strawberry cheesecake uh, because (laughs) I'm saving that for, for, for Christmas. And uh, so when I'm gone, then you go and you you start uh, touching the strawberry cheesecake. Is that okay? Well, I, I asked you not to, so uh, you're you're definitely offending against the the rules of my home, let's say. Right. And so uh, is that is that wrong? Well, yeah, that's wrong. It's not a very serious thing, but it is it is wrong. Like uh, you should not have done that. Or if a child, your your child, for example, were to disobey mom, who said not to touch the strawberry cheesecake. And the point there is that it was a sin of disobedience. It doesn't mean that there was something wrong with the cheesecake. So the this sin of disobedience, we we don't know exactly why God gave that command, but we do know that he did give the command. And so the sin was not that uh, our first parents uh, did something which was... uh, People often imagine that it's some sort of sexual sin, for example. It wasn't. It was a sin of mm-hmm. disobedience. And this sin, God said, the day you do it, you will die. Now, of course, they did not die that day. They lived for many years afterwards. The death was in the soul because our soul lives on God. And when we turn against God, so we call that mortal sin, we no longer live in God. So Adam and Eve realized what they'd done oh my goodness, what are we going to do now? And so we need to try and repair this, but they can't. They have turned against God. They have sinned and been alienated from God. How now can they return? So if you take that on a a human level, imagine that you break up with your friend. You know, you commit some serious uh, crime against your friend. You, You betray him. And then you say, oh my goodness, how am I going to go back? Well, the answer is you're not going to be able to repair it by yourself. You're going to have to go humbly to your friend and he is going to have to forgive you. And so in order to go back to where we were to redeem ourselves, we're going to have to do something, but we're not able to. That's what the redemption is. Redemption means to buy back. Um, I was short on money last week, I have to say. And I took one of my confreres uh, valuable uh, golden uh, medals and I went out to a pawn shop and I pawned the medal. And now I need to try and buy it back before he realizes what has happened. That's what it means to redeem. But we can't buy ourselves back. We need a savior. We need someone who is able to buy us back, to bring us back. And that savior is not just going to be any ordinary human being. He's going to be the Messiah, the one. And this, it, it, uh, it clicks with all of our uh, understanding of um, our literature and mythology, uh, Andrew. It's that it's always the case that in a world where everything is really terrible, one man comes to save the day. <laughs> okay? Yeah. That's uh, my... Uh, bad uh my bad <laughs> imitation of a hollywood movie trailer but it's always the same isn't it it's, it is yeah. it's the world is going to pass one man will step up to do it and this is because it is in fact the truth it's from the very very beginning we fell away things are in bad shape who is going to uh, save us one man will do it and this one man is not going to just be any man, because in order to buy us back, to repair the uh, divorce from God, he's going to have to be able to mediate between us and God. And that is precisely who Jesus Christ is, who was promised in advance 
He was the one man who existed before he was born. He was expected, he was foretold, not only in the prophecies of the Jewish people, but also in the prophecies of the pagans. If you look, for example, at the uh, the pagans, the Romans, even the, the Chinese, everybody is expecting a Messiah. Everybody is expecting a Redeemer. The Jews, of course, had the most precise predictions of who this man was, where he would come from, where he would be born, when he would be born. You know the whole thing about uh, Herod becoming the king of Israel around the time of the coming of Christ. Of course, it was Herod who uh, then ordered the massacre of young boys around about Jerusalem at that time. But the whole point is that Herod was fulfilling the prophecy. He knew that this was the time foretold for the coming of the Savior, because the prophecy of Jacob was that there shall not uh, lack a ruler from Judah until he come who is to come. And of course, Herod, being an Edomite, was not of the tribe of Judah. And so at the time, he was trying to pass himself off as the Messiah. And when he heard about the the three wise men coming to visit the, the child who was born, he was paranoid because he knew that this was in fact the time. Now, this uh, coming of our Lord Jesus Christ People tend to, uh, some people tend to simply say, well, yeah, he was just a wise man. Uh, like we've had so many other wise men, like we've had Buddha, we've had Confucius, uh, all of these things. But he was he was completely different. Jesus Christ was completely different because he did not come into this world simply to, to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm a pretty wise man, so I'm going to tell you some things that I think. He came into this world in order to do something. He came into this world to do something. My hour has not yet come. My hour has now come. What is this hour? This hour is that Jesus Christ came into this world to save the world. How did he save the world? He saved it by his sacrifice on the cross. I want to clarify this uh, here because people living in 2024, they're going to say to themselves, yeah, I mean, that's just, uh, you know, fairy story, sacrifice on the cross, all that sort of thing. It's not at all. It is that Jesus Christ uh, offered a sacrifice. A sacrifice is when you take something and you give it to God. So we tell children, for example, that, you know, make a sacrifice. Uh, do not take the apple. Let your brother have it. Okay, that's a sacrifice. Why is it a sacrifice? You're taking something and you're giving it to God. You're saying, God, you know, I want to have this apple, but I'm going to offer it up to you. I'm not my brother have it as well. Okay? That's a that's a sacrifice in a sense. So a sacrifice is any action which you do for God. Let's be clear. Jesus Christ could have offered any action to God. He didn't have to go to Calvary, but he chose to go to Calvary. And he chose that that particular action which he offered up to his father through obedience to his father's will. His father who wanted to allow him to be arrested and murdered. God the Father did not cause him positively to be arrested and murdered, but he allowed it. God's God's will. It's like this is like Job, who who is having all of these things happen to him, and he says, Blessed be the name of the Lord. God allows evil to happen to the good. Why does he do that? And Jesus Christ shows us that God allows evil to happen to the good. Because when the good offer up this as a sacrifice out of obedience and love to God the Father, it saves the world. Okay, that's the uh, that's the the truth, which is above our human reason. We think, as uh, purely humanly, oh, this is unacceptable. You know, who is this pilot guy anyway? You know, let's call up our congressman and senators and the Supreme Court and all that. No, it's the truth is that if it is in fact God's will that you suffer, then offer it up to God and this will save the world. And by the Savior himself, the Savior himself offering up the uh, the sacrifice on the cross, he indeed saves the world. And this Savior is Jesus Christ. And there is nobody in history who is in, in comparison to Jesus Christ. Even the, 
the the uh, historicity, for example, or the authenticity of the Gospels. I was just reading some uh, an article recently, Andrew, regarding the very latest research into uh, the early documents on the Gospels. There are 25,000 mm. early witnesses to the Gospels dating back as far as the first century. There is no other document in history which even exceeds a thousand examples, which go back beyond the eighth century, for example. Now I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm obviously summarizing that, and so there may be uh, some detail to put in, but effectively that's what it is. It's right. that the truth of Jesus Christ, of his existence, of his um, actions, of his sacrifice, these truths are more certain than any other truths in history. And yet people come along and say, oh, I don't know if that was even true. I was uh, watching a pagan uh, video recently that is uh, a, a true pagan. He's, he's some sort of pagan priest. And he was saying, well, we don't even know if Christ existed. So that's, <laughs> that's a bit like yeah. saying, well, I don't even know if the sun is real. You know, I, I know that you can see it, but maybe it's not real. So it's, 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 it just doesn't make any sense. Uh, that was one of the things that converted C.S. Lewis C.S. Lewis was, was an atheist, and so one of the things that converted him was reading uh, Chesterton's The Everlasting Man, and the other was when his uh, professor, you know, just happened to say, yes, there are many more witnesses for the truth of the Gospels than there are for any other ancient text. So, well, if that's the case, then we have to be logical that this is, in fact, historical. Jesus Christ... Yeah is in fact uh, an historical figure. And he, he then, uh, C.S. Lewis, goes into the uh, so-called trilemma of St. Augustine, which is, if Jesus Christ is real, then he was either God, that is, who he says he was, or he was mad, or he was a devil. So he was either God because he said that he was God, and if he wasn't God, then he was mad, but he clearly is not mad. Everybody says that he is a wise man, and he's not a devil because he doesn't go around doing evil. He doesn't go around uh, trying to uh, kill people and deceive them. And so the conclusion is that he was God. So the Redeemer saves us, and this Redeemer founded a church. And this church, let's just put out of your mind for a second the church of the um, local Protestant denomination. Because you could add any street and you see that here we have the redeemed church of God. Here we have the new and improved redeemed church of God. Here we have the digitally remastered and improved church of God or whatever it might be. <laughs> uh, yeah. Put all of that out of your mind. We're not talking about those. Those are, we call those churches, but they're not. The church, the church is the mystical body of Jesus Christ. Mystical right. means mysterious. And mysterious means that you can't see it with your eyes, but it is there. So it's a mystery, for example, when I am baptized. So I can see the water being poured, I can hear the words being said, but what I cannot see is the justification of the soul from sin. But it's really there. And this church which Jesus Christ founded it's not founded by just any man. You look at all of the uh, so-called Protestant churches, and I say so-called not because I'm trying to denigrate uh, good people who happen to be, uh, you know, the descendants of the Protestants from the 15th, 16th century, not at all, because uh, I know very well that there are many good and sincere people who are truly seeking the truth uh, within Protestantism. Um, mm -hmm. But... Your religion was founded by a man. You know, if you're if you're in the Church of England, your religion was founded by Henry VIII. Or uh, if you're if you're a Mormon, you know, your religion was founded by Joseph Smith in uh, New York State back in the 19th century, whatever it might be. There is one church, the Church, the Catholic Church, which was founded by Jesus Christ, and he founded the Church and told us how things would go. Okay, these are the parables of the Kingdom of Heaven. The Kingdom of Heaven, he says is like to a man who found a treasure in a field. That's the church. Jesus Christ went into the field, which is the world, and he found a treasure. That is, he made himself 
all those who believe in his name and who are baptized, who believe what he has taught, these are the members of the church. But he told us that the church would be composed of wheat and weeds, that he would plant the good seed and the enemy would come along and plant weeds and that he would allow both to grow together until the end of time. Or again, the church would be like a net cast into the sea and into that net came fish, both good and bad. And it's only when they came to shore at the end of time that they would be divided by the fishermen. And so we see immediately uh, from this truth about the Catholic Church that actually most of the uh, criticisms of the Catholic Church are based on a misconception. Mm. Most of the criticisms which you hear today are, well, how can the Catholic Church be the true church? Just look at Cardinal so-and-so, or just look at Bishop uh, Bishop such-and-such, or just look at the Pope, or whatever it might be. Surely this proves that the Catholic Church is not the true church. Or look mm-hmm. at the Inquisition. Look at Galileo, all of these things. Say, well, uh, we have seen that throughout, throughout our, our series, we've actually looked into these and found that many of these allegations against the church are untrue. So, for example, the allegation that the church is against science, for example, well, that's just untrue. And the uh, the whole Galileo case, which we went into, showed that the church was uh, rather trying to uh, assert its authority over sacred scripture, rather than saying that Galileo, of course, was such a nasty person, uh, etc. Mm-hmm. So the 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 misunderstanding is, well, the church is just going to be composed of good people. And that is an infection of Protestantism into our thinking. Because Protestantism came along and said, the church is composed of the saved. It's composed of those who are actually good. Whereas the reality is, the church is composed of good fish and bad fish. The church is composed of wheat and weeds. And it's only at the end of time that these are going to be separated. And so, yeah, Bishop so-and-so did a terrible thing. Well, actually, I could tell you about Archbishop so-and-so was even worse. Yeah. Why? Because that's it. He's The church is divine in its constitution, divine in the grace that it gives and the truth that it teaches, but it is human in its members. And that is, in fact, reality. If you look at the, the sort of uh, human ideas of churches, well, they don't really make any sense. So so they they don't actually reflect life as it really is. Because in life, people believe, but they may not always act in consequence of their beliefs. And so this, this one Catholic church is the mystical body of Christ. And it's not to be confused with the straw man that certain people have put up there, uh, such as the Protestants saying that, oh, Catholics believe this when in fact they don't. Or, you know, look, the Catholics believe that everything that the Pope says is infallible. Well, no, they don't. The Catholic Church knows that it has the promise of assistance from Christ and that it has infallibility, but this infallibility is limited to simply defining what was revealed by Jesus Christ. Pope can't come out and say, uh, you know, I, I declare that the sky is green. And so now everybody has to believe that the sky is green. No, the Pope has the power to define the faith in certain circumstances. And if he were to, uh, for example, uh, go and say something which is not in accordance with tradition, then we would be able to say to him, well, that's not true, Holy Father. And we see that, unfortunately, today. Just some time ago, the the Pope, or rather the Vatican, came out and said, well, now we can have blessings for same-sex couples. Okay, mm-hmm. And they used a lot of uh, sophistic arguments to say, well, of course, you can bless anybody. Of course, you can bless anybody who is willing to receive a blessing in good faith. But to say to, you know, your local group of, of, uh, of thieves, you know, there's a local foundation of the thieves of Montreal near here. And so I'm going to say, look, we're going to have a mass for thieves. So I want you to come along yeah. with the uh, tools of your trade and, you know, everybody can receive a blessing. Well, no, because then what I'm simply doing is I'm showing approval for robbery. So I can't do that. So if I say, well, you can have, uh, you know, same-sex couples can come along as such, okay? 
clearly if if there are two people who are living in sin um, and they come along and they're looking for guidance to find the way of God, then clearly I'm going to encourage them to find the way of God, which is involved involving turning away from sin. But if they come along and saying, you know, we are proud uh, assassins, uh, we belong to the Contract Killing Association of Canada, and, uh, you know, we're, we're continuing in that. We think that it's a legitimate way of finding our calling, making a living, so we'd like you to bless us. Well, you can't do that because you're just approving it. So in reality, though, you see that the... This is this has not changed the faith. It's not an argument against the Catholic Church being the true church. In fact, this is simply showing that the Catholic Church is the true church because all of this has been taken care of. And Vatican I came along and said that uh, the Pope is infallible in these circumstances. When he, speaking as the supreme pastor of the church, speaking on a matter of faith and morals, intends to bind the church to believe what he says which means that outside of that case, he is not infallible. Okay, right. so that means then that, you know, he's not infallible. So this is not something which is uh, which is going to say, well, the Pope said this, therefore I don't believe the Catholic Church is the true church. The Catholic Church is the true church because Jesus Christ, who is the true Savior, he gave the keys to Peter. He gave the keys to Peter. And the thing about a key, Andrew, is that it opens the door. There, yeah. there is a door stopping us from being united with God. The purpose of religion is to unite us with God. That's what true religion does. Most religion is false. There is a true religion. And this key opens the door because what's stopping us from going to God is sin, which is removed by grace, and error. Jesus Christ came into this world to teach us truth. I know that Pope Francis has said recently that, you know, people who think that uh, the church gives you easy truths uh, are mistaken because what the, what the church is doing is it's sending you on a journey. Well, not quite true, I'm afraid, Pope Francis. It's that Jesus Christ came into this world and he said that I have come to bear witness to the truth. Okay, Pilate says, what have you done? Jesus says, I have come to bear witness to the truth. And Jesus Christ teaches us the truth because in order to make your way to heaven, you need to know the way. And he tells us the way. And this truth and goodness, uh, which Jesus Christ gives us, are transmitted by the Catholic Church. Not by just some uh, you know, individual who happens to, to uh, you know, be your local priest or something, because maybe he could be weird. Yeah, it's possible. It's by what the Catholic Church has always taught, and that's why in the crisis which we are now, not only in society, which is a very serious crisis in society, when we are um, even sort of asking ourselves whether dogs are dogs or perhaps they could be cats, uh, which is a grave, grave crisis when when we have difficulty in seeing truth. But the mm -hmm. crisis in the church, in that the leaders within the church at the moment, as has happened before at other times, uh, they are not clearly showing us the way. So what do we do? We do follow the rule which was laid down many centuries ago at another time of crisis, which is you hold fast to what was believed everywhere by everyone. Someone comes along and says, you know, times have changed. Adultery is not a sin anymore. We got to make ourselves relevant to the world in order to stay uh, popular. No, 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 no. Hold fast to what was always believed everywhere by everyone. Do not worry about the the things that people say about the Catholic Church. That the Catholic Church is is some sort of uh, oppressive organization. All of the propaganda, etc. The Catholic Church sets you free because it makes it possible for you to hold fast to the, to the revealed truth which we need in order to make our way to heaven and it gives us the grace which jesus christ instituted by the sacraments it's true we're in a time of great confusion at the moment but this time of confusion will clear if you wish to save your soul then you must hold fast to the rock which christ gave us which is the catholic church so that's my uh, that's my encouragement to you. 
and uh, be assured of our prayers, prayers of all, all good Catholics, because the Catholic Church is true, not because I believe it. Okay, I'm not a greater right. person than you because I happen to be Catholic. It's I believe it because it is true, and I know that I'm a miserable sinner, and I pray that you will hold fast to the truth given by Jesus Christ, hold fast to the church which was founded by him, and by that means that you and those close to you and all uh, can save their souls, because that's all that really matters. Absolutely. And as I mentioned with Father Robinson at the very beginning when we started episode one back in March of this series, if this 40 plus episode endeavor causes one person to ask a question that leads to a conversion, it's all worth it. That's it. That's all That's all we need to do is just uh, is get out of the way of grace. We'll, we'll provide some information and some help, but essentially, Father, you and I, I mean, well, you are you are very different. You help provide grace as a priest, but as lay people, uh, oftentimes the best thing to do is just get out of the way of grace and and let let God do the work. Exactly, and simply to try to uh, be the uh, the other Christ, which our baptism and our confirmation, and in my case, holy orders, is is uh, commissioned us to do to be the good order of Christ to lead people to Christ. And it's true that some Catholics are scandals because they do not act like Christ. Mm -hmm. But this was foretold, and each Catholic needs to uh, seek to act like Christ because that is what will attract souls to Jesus Christ. And uh, I pray for myself uh, that after preaching the gospel, I do not become a castaway, but I pray also for all, uh, all souls to find our Lord Jesus Christ and the peace of soul, the peace of the family, society, which comes from that. Amen. Father, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much, Andrew. God bless. You too.